Well, good morning, everyone. Let's stand together and sing this morning.
Good morning. Welcome to Monticello Christian Church. Um, so happy to see so many people here. Welcome also if you're watching online or perhaps later on YouTube. Um, if you're new, if you could text the number new to the number on the screen, that would just help us connect with you better and help us connect you better with those in the church. So I don't know what summer's like for you or your family, but for us, summer is absolute chaos. And lately, it's felt like we're in this never ending season of scrambling. So usually by the time that August hits, I'm longing for this seasonal shift that fall brings. I know some people are like, oh, fall, but to me, it just brings this much needed season of rest. It's back to school, back to football, go Packers, and back to so many you know, normal routines that seem to slip away in the summer. So in these moments of chaos and scrambling that I tend to go to through in these summer seasons, I go into what we call in our house survival mode. And in survival mode, I'm likely burning the candle at both ends. I'm struggling to find things that fill my cup or things that bring my weary soul to rest. So things like my eating habits, my workout routine, and even quiet time with God all go into this different version in survival mode and none in a positive way. So it brings me really great joy that we are standing here and it's August this morning, that we're in this church building, that these lockers and jerseys are behind me because I know that there is a seasonal approach, a, a seasonal slowdown approaching. So even though I'm tired, I know that God has been meeting me in my chaos all along. So this morning, I hope that you find rest in whatever may be making you your life feel chaotic or weary right now. And I, I hope that you invite God to meet you there in those moments. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight.
deserve it but still you give your love to us still you choose us still you break through each and every barrier that we may put up and you come to us and you comfort us and you love us and we are so thankful for that father help us to accept that love help us to appreciate that love and give it to others help us to be drawn to you. Help us to hear you today, this morning. God, we're so thankful for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Hey, we're on the way down to the Cardinals game. Guys, who's going to win tonight? Cardinals. Oh, oh, dear. Oh, oh. Hey Jace, what was your first youth group experience? Uh, it would have been last year or last winter when we did the ski trip for the high school kids, and uh, it was a great experience. Went to Wisconsin, first time I've been on skis in a very, very long time, and it showed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was off the skis a couple of times as well, but uh, it was a great experience for myself and my wife and my oldest boy at the time, Colby, who's now 
graduated from high school and no longer in the program. The next question, Jason, would be, what impacts have you seen in the students' lives? So it's been awesome. I mean, you see these kids come together as friends, as strangers, uh, you know, not knowing each other in the beginning of this program, whether it be that they're freshmen or they're new to the program as a sophomore or whatever, and to see them grow together and grow spiritually, growing together as friends, growing together as attending church together, sitting together in the sanctuary, it's awesome. It's an awesome experience to watch. So Jace, what's been a blessing that you yourself have experienced in serving with the youth at MCC? So I think the biggest blessing for me is watching my own kids grow in the program and grow in their friendships that they're making and growing in their spiritual walk with, with God and all of this. I mean, it's awesome to be able to see them do that uh, and hopefully continue, you know, well beyond into their adulthood, I hope. And so what were like one of the most or some of the most notable moments you had with the youth group? So honestly, probably one of the biggest things and it was very cost effective for us to do. We in fact gave back to the community during one of the snowstorms we had this last year. Went out, me, you, a lot of uh, the pa Pastor Jerry and a big group of the kids and we did snow removal for a lot of people in the community that needed it. It was an awesome coming together of, of manpower and helping people that were in need. And I just, I mean, I, I've talked about it several times in passing to other people and I think it was an awesome experience. You know, my kids didn't even know how to honestly and i'm ashamed to say this didn't know how to shovel and they learned that day and i mean it was great to give back to those that needed it so i heard that you're serving on the newly formed um safety team at the church is that right Yes, you're right. Uh, we are. There's a group of us meeting. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings thus far. We're trying to get this thing off the ground. Look forward to uh, presenting some more information to the congregation soon so that we can uh, implement this program and keep all of us safe. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in the works. Jace was willing to get in the game and serve at MCC. We hope his story inspires you. We look forward to seeing what we have in store. Welcome to Monticello Christian Church. It's a brand new series that we're starting today called Get in the Game. And over the next four weeks, we're going to have some fun and talk about church and using the analogy of sports. And so uh, we're going to have some fun with this. In fact, next Sunday, it, what, what we're asking you to do, if you want to kind of join in and have some fun with this, we're going to call it Jersey Sunday. So if you've got some kind of a team jersey, uh, yes, even if it's a Bears jersey, you know, wear it with your family, with your kids, whatever you want to do, come we're going to have a place set up where you can snap a picture, uh, or we'll do that for you uh, with your family just to have some fun. We'll throw them on social media just to let everybody know that we are a cool church and we're into sports. But we are going to talk about uh, church through the lens of sports and athletics. I, I'm looking at some of you. You're already writing down, okay, Jersey Sunday next week. Don't forget, go out and buy the coolest jersey you can find. 
But I, I, I want to tell you, you don't have to know anything about sports to be a part of this series or to be a part of what's going on here around Monticello Christian Church. Because basically, with, with an understanding of what it means to be a part of a team, we can understand so much of what Jesus said about how the church is supposed to function and the part that you are supposed to play, or the part that you can play. I'll say it that way. And so uh, that leads me to this whole idea that uh, we want you to come to Next Step Lunch. If you've never been to Next Step Lunch before, if this is a new church experience for you, uh, if you want to know more about what Monticello Christian Church is about, if you want to find out a different way or a, a way to plug in here, we'd love for you to come to that. And that is August 28th. And there's a place on our website as well as our Facebook page where you can sign up. And uh, also we sent out an email this week. So please come to that if you've never been to that before. Even if you've been here for years and years and uh, you just kind of want to, you know, peel the layers back and uh, come and be a part of a new experience, please do that. If you have recently attended a Next Step Lunch and you are an alumnus and you want to come back and serve as a table host to bless other people in the same way that you were blessed this coming year, I would love to talk with you after this service. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do. It's a fun experience. You get a great free lunch and there's child care provided. So please consider doing that. But back to this series, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to invite you to be a part of this team. I can remember when I was in uh, high school, I probably didn't pay attention to this enough in high school, but like when I would go back to the high school after I graduated, you walk in the front door, what do you see, uh, especially in a small rural high school, what do you see? It's the trophy case, right? You walk in there and you see, you know, they've, they've got the proverbial basketball with the net hanging over it, and they've got all of the different trophies from the 1960s that, you know, somebody won, somebody that's, you know, maybe still famous in town, and, and you're, they're showing you their legacy. And the same is true for a college experience. Um, you know, please forgive me. I am wearing an Indiana shirt today. I have to stay true to who I am as a Hoosier. But I can remember uh, my daughter and I for several years would go over and uh, we would watch the last uh, basketball game right before Christmas uh, at Assembly Hall in Bloomington, Indiana. Just a, a great father-daughter time. But I just, I, I remember walking into that very historic place, and uh, you, you just, you just kind of feel it when you walk. First of all, I'm feeling like I'm with 19,000 of my favorite friends and family in this building, you know, and they're all wearing the red and white striped pants, and, uh, but we're having a great time, but when you go in there and you see all of the banners that are hanging in the auditorium from all the national championships, and, you know, what you feel when you go in there, and I'm sure maybe it's been a part of your college tradition, whatever college or university that you went to, what they want to communicate is this winning tradition that they have been a part of at some point in time. Now, it may have been a few years, but still, uh, they were at some point in their existence, you know, unless you're a Cubs fan, they were a part of a winning tradition. Hopefully, you don't have to wait another 108 years for that to happen. I can remember when I was in Bible college, Kentucky Christian uh, College, it's now Kentucky Christian University now, and I remember watching ESPN one night, and they had, they had reported that this little-known Christian college in eastern Kentucky was the only college or university uh, in any division that had achieved the title of having back-to-back men's and women's championships in basketball and it was it was a quite an accomplishment that so they actually said our name you know on, on national tv and, and and it's true we kicked everybody's tail now I wasn't a part of that team you know I played intramural sports there but I wasn't good enough to be a part of a national championship team but I can still remember the first time I came there as a freshman and I walked into that gymnasium and I mean you know both walls the men's wall and the women's wall covered with banners from every sport that they participated in. I mean, they, they were just winners. They had a winning tradition in any sport that they were involved with. And that's so important because you want to be a part of a winning tradition. But, you know, maybe we didn't go to a college like that. Maybe we didn't go to college that, or a high school that had that kind of a tradition. Well, that's okay because what I want you to know today is that you are a part of a winning tradition. It doesn't matter if you're high school or your college team or even your elementary team, if you have to go back that far, you know, to reach back that far to find, you know, a time where you were a winner. It doesn't matter. You right now are a part of a winning tradition because you are a part of a team that has all the makings of a dynasty. You are a part of a team that has been able to take ordinary people and turn them into extraordinary players. 
You are a part of a winning tradition that is so well coached that the, that the coach is still revered and loved and respected by his players for the last 2,000 years. And yes, of course, I'm talking about God's team, the church. And if you are a part of the church, then you are a part of this winning tradition. And, and you know, winning tradition and winning teams, great teams play in great games with a lot of significance. And there's no greater significance than God's plan to save our broken world. I mean, I don't know if you've been paying attention at all, but it does kind of seem right now that our world is kind of spiraling out of control. And it would be easy for us to become afraid and freak out about everything that's going on in our world, but we have to understand that there is a plan in place and has always been in place for God to rescue and heal and restore this world. And so it's so vital that we talk about the team, his team, and what it's going to take for his team to continue this winning tradition. Great teams are led by great coaches. And great coaches that come to mind for me uh, would be one person. And I know this is very comfortable, but you've got to respect the legacy, uh, legacy of Vince Lombardi. Great coach, won a lot of players, won a lot of games with some no-name players, some great players. But he's known for this statement that I've heard we've, we, I, I know we've heard this statement before where he would, he would gather his team at the beginning of the season, all of his team, all of his coaching staff, and he would sit them down and he'd get this football, he was a football coach, and he would say, this is a football. And with those five words, what he was communicating was this, this sense of humility. I'm the coach, you're the players. It's my job to coach. It's your job to do what I say as the player, even if it's painful, even if it causes you to make sacrifices, even if it's something that you don't agree with. And so it reflected an attitude of humility that they had to adopt if they were going to play for one of the greatest coaches in history. I mean, after all, his name is on the Super Bowl trophy. And it doesn't matter what the name read on the back of their jersey, whether or not they were a superstar, they were going to be playing for the name of the team that was on the front of their jersey. And they had to have a great sense of humility and to do whatever it was required by and expected by the coach if they were going to continue and be a part of that winning tradition. And I think that is an awesome place for us as a church to start, to go back to the very basic idea, and not to make any assumptions that there's no MVPs or VIPs in the room, nobody like that. We're all players, and we all have a role to play, and so therefore we all have to go back to the basics and understand, you know, the, the team dynamics of what it means to be a part of the local church so that we can all play together to carry out this winning tradition. And so it's a great place for us to start. So I want to go back to one of the first times in Scripture that Jesus actually mentions the term church. If you want to turn there, it's Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. Great conversation that Jesus is having. He's talking with his starting lineup. He's talking with the first guys that were a part of his, you know, his group. We call them disciples. We call them followers. And uh, he'd already spent some time with them. Uh, they're watching. They're learning. He had coached them up, and then he sent them out very early. And, and it's something that as a church, we need to get a lot better at. Uh, what, what he did is he sent them out to learn and to gain the experiences so when that they would come back, they would know what they don't know now. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts uh, the other day. It was John Maxwell, expert in leadership. And he said, you know, because I think we do college all wrong. He said, I think students need to go to college for a year and then they need to be forced to take at least a year off to go out in the world, the real world, and to become wiser in the things that they are unwise about. So they come back and they have all of the right questions because now they have the life experience and they know now what they don't know. And I'm like, what? That's, that's pretty great advice if you ask me. And I think in terms of what Jesus did here, very early in the process of making disciples, Jesus sent his disciples out on what I like to call like a little short-term mission trip so they would gain this experience and come back to him and like, okay, now we know we don't know everything, and now we know that we need to listen to you even more. And so that's what good coaches do. You know, one of the things when, when you come to this church, if you are a newer person, uh, we're not going to make you jump through a bunch of hoops to begin serving here. Now, obviously, there's some things that we would like to know about you if you're going to serve in a specific way, but there are certain things that you could do here that 
if you're here on Sunday number two, if you're willing to do it, we're going we're gonna to let you do it. I can still remember we were in New England. It was so funny. We just started this church, and so we didn't know anybody. There, you know, there's nobody that's been here for years. This was like the church's second or third Sunday. There's this, there's this, guy, that, <clears throat> there's this guy that came. And I remember he's one of these guys that could grow a beard all the way up to the bottom of his eyes, you know. So he kind of looked like a caveman. And, uh, and I remember his name, his name was Nathan. And uh, he, came back the, he came back the next Sunday. He'd shaved. And I had to, he had to reintroduce himself to me. I had no idea who he was. But by the third Sunday that he was at our church, he was on the worship team. So, I mean, we fast-track people. Get him involved. Get him in the game as soon as we possibly can. This is what Jesus is doing here. His disciples hadn't been with him very long. He's already sending them out to figure out so they can figure out what they don't know. And so Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of of the living God. Jesus is asking his starting lineup, who do people, as you've been out, you've been talking to people in the community based on the reputation, of, you know, my reputation is getting out, who are other people saying who they think I am? And some of the answers were somewhat predictable based on his teaching, based on some of the miracles. And, but Peter makes this confession. This is where we get this Confession, since we ask people when they're getting ready to be baptized, you know, you will repeat this confession after me. It's Peter's confession. This is who he believed Jesus is, was at that moment. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. This is huge because what he's saying there is he believes that Jesus is the promised one that had been promised for centuries. The, the, the one who, uh, the one whom the, the Jewish people had been anticipating and waiting for because they believed that they were going to be freed from Roman oppression and they were going to experience all of God's blessings at that moment. They had a different image of mind of what the Messiah meant, but, and it was the wrong perception, but still, you know, Peter confesses, Jesus, you are the one, you are the Son of God. He has seen enough to understand that he is the real deal and then the other thing that he declares, and he doesn't even realize that he's declaring this, is that Jesus has authority over all of those other people. Those are some very important people. Jeremiah, Elijah the prophet, John the Baptist, or you know, some well-known people during that time to the, to the, to the Jewish crowd. And, and when Peter says, you're the Messiah, what, really what he's saying is, is, I believe that you are the promised one of God, and you are far and above all of those people, and you have the ultimate authority over all of those people by virtue of who you are and your relationship with your heavenly Father. Now, so he, he talks first about the identity of Jesus, okay? So remember, this whole trek, we're going back to the basics. We have to understand this. You'll understand this here just a little bit. We're going back to the basics to understand the identity of Jesus, and then Jesus talks about building his church. Look at verse eight, verses 18 and 19. Now I say to you, uh, Peter, you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And so the church is founded in the name and uh, in, the, in the authority of Jesus, and because of that, the church is going to have unlimited power and authority. More power and authority than any other organization, any other team in the history of humanity. There's no other organization, business, technology firm, company, whatever, that is going to have as much power and as much authority as the church of God on this earth. The church is supposed to be unstoppable. Do you have that view of the church right now? Do you think most of the world, if they were to go back and read the words of Jesus to Peter and his disciples and saying, do you really believe that the church has that kind of power? That whatever those who are following Christ, whatever, you know, whatever that they want, if it's in accordance with the will of God, if it's in accordance with his mission, that God is like, whatever you ask for, <clears throat> excuse me, on this earth, it's going to be, it's going to have its stamp of approval in heaven. Whatever you lock down or bind or pray against on earth as it stands against the church and the mission of God, 
It's also going to be stopped in heaven. It's going to have that kind of authority. Do you feel that most people in the world perceive the church to have that kind of power? I don't know. I don't think they do. And I wonder why. And I wonder if it's because we've missed something back here in the basics, something that has to do with the identity of Jesus and maybe believing who he is and what he stands for, the power he's given us. We are supposed to be unstoppable. Now, if that's not a winning tradition, I don't know what is. Jesus is basically saying, whatever you want, if it's in accordance with my will and my purpose for the church, it's yours. You got it. Whatever you don't want to happen, whatever going to stand against the church, if you're praying about that and you work together for that and you're trusting me with that, then it's not going to happen. If it's a part of the God's will and God's plan, if it's going to help the mission of the church, it's going to be yours. But catch that, you've got to stick with the mission. So understand this. The idea of the church comes after the revelation of who Jesus is as the Messiah, as the promised one of God, which should tell us this, that the church, that we as the church are all about Jesus Christ. And I, and I understand it's like, duh. We're like, no, it's not. It's, it's really, is, it's, it's, it's not as common or as basic to a lot of people as it really should be. Jesus is the big deal. He is the only deal of the church. And it's as foundational as a football is to the game of football. But I believe that the reason that the world is not looking at the church as powerful, as a force to be reckoned with, or as unstoppable, is because we lose track and we get distracted by so many other smaller agendas and smaller things. Smaller meaning our personal pursuits, our personal goals, our personal agenda, politics, culture, and we forget that it's all about Jesus. I mean, this is like really basic here. We forget his plan. We forget it's all about his authority. And God's team is centered on a person, not a place, not a program. And see, when Jesus, when he, when he mentions the word church, it's, it's the word ecclesia, and that word had nothing to do with the building. It really didn't have anything to do with church as what we think about church. A lot of times now, the more common understanding of church. It really just means the called out ones. It's, it's talking about some kind of a town gathering. A, a town hall meeting, if you will. A, a, a group of people coming together because something common has pulled them together. There's a common purpose. There's a common cause. And they're going to rally around this. And so it's never to be focused on a building or a location, but a people. A church is a team of people centered on Jesus. You see, the church is central to God's plan, but Jesus is the center of God's plan. Again, going back to the basics. And so once they're talking about this, Jesus tells his key players that they're guaranteed to win. And he would build his church and the gates of hell would never stand against it. He's helping them to understand that they are a part of a winning tradition, that they are going to be winners in the end. I remember another great quote from Vince Lombardi who said this. He said, I said, if you don't feel like a winner, he said, you don't belong here. The church of Jesus Christ, God's church is full of winners. Now, I mean, you may have come here this morning and you may not feel like a winner because you've got all kinds of life issues right now. And I appreciate what Bree said. I, I concur with that. You may be feeling beaten down, knocked down, tired. The last two and a half years have been extremely difficult. It's been difficult on your health. It's been difficult on your finances. It's been difficult. It's just brought a lot more stress. You were already stressed out before we ever got into a pandemic, and you're, we're, we're stressed out even more now, and so you're coming in here, and you, you may not feel like you're on your game all the time. But understand, you are, you are a winner, and you're a winner because... Jesus Christ came down to die for you. He came down to this earth and he gave up everything that was rightfully his for you. And he defeated sin and death through his death on a cross and the resurrection for you so that you could be and feel like a winner today no matter what else is going on in the world. And so the victory is ours not because of anything that we've done 
It's because of everything that Christ has already done for us. And so what that means, if we're feeling like winners and we've got, we, we can experience the victory of being a part of a winning tradition, what that looks like for us is that we don't live or act like or even feel like the rest of the world does. We don't live in constant fear of everything that's going on in the world. Whether it's this economy that's spiraling out of control or, you know, just the, the corruption and divisiveness, uh, divisiveness of politics on both sides of the aisle. Or just the blatant decay of our culture. Can, can I just feel, say, I, I feel so uh, sad for, and in some ways, a com- camaraderie with parents today. And what parents have to struggle with in navigating their children through the world. There are so many things that are, that are different. And as I look at my, you know, my own children and my grandson, and I think about the world that he's going to grow up in and what they're going to have to navigate him through, and I, I feel for him. I feel for the next generation. But we can help that generation, too, be a part of a winning tradition by being the best church we can be. We show others how to win by how we live. So let's go back to this conversation. Peter's on board with everything that Jesus is saying. Jesus, you know, I believe you are the Christ. I believe your church is going to be great. It's going to be unstoppable. Nothing's going to stand its way. I'm all on board with that. And then Jesus goes into what's going to be required for the mission. First by him, because remember what coaches do, coaches lead people to do things that they've already done in the way that they've done it. If you cannot lead someone where you are not going yourself where you have not already been, you just can't do it. People try it all the time, just can't do it. You have no credibility as a coach if you're trying to lead people where you're not going or you haven't already been there. And so Jesus talks about his own mission first and what he's going to have to do, and then he lays out what they're going to have to do. So Peter is the MVP right now, and he's all on board with Jesus. He's the outspoken leader at this point until Jesus starts talking about the fact that he has to intentionally go to his own death, that he will be handed over to the religious leaders, that he will be mocked and beaten and tortured. Eventually, he'll be handed over to the Romans who will put him to death on a Roman cross, which is one one of the worst ways to die, one of the most embarrassing, undignified ways to die because you have been branded as a criminal of the state at that point and he was crucified outside the city in a place called the place of the skull I mean there was just nothing that was good and respectful and dignified about the way that he would die and boy when Peter hears that he's like oh wait 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 Jesus I'm not not on board with that one because Jesus you know Peter's got his own way I'm all on board with this whole thing of like okay I get it you know this is like a player telling a coach you know what coach I respect you I respect all your years of experience. I respect all the thousands of games that you won. But in terms of like this play here, I think we need to call a different play. Because I, I, this is not going to turn out well. So this is, this is Peter going to Jesus and saying, okay, listen, I get it that you're the son of God and everything. And you're the one that all the prophets, the law and the prophets have talked about now for a couple thousand years. I, I understand that. However, I don't think you're looking at this right, Jesus. I think we need to do, I think, <clears throat> I think we need to go a different direction here that's really what's going on here the player is telling the coach how the game should be played at the most crucial junction Peter did not like Jesus's way of thinking and Jesus rebukes Peter because he didn't understand the plan you see Jesus he clearly understood what was going on here this is the enemy trying to throw him off track we often think that there was one time where Jesus was tempted look at this passage verse 23 Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. That's an insight into his humanity. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. In that moment, when Jesus said, get away from me, Satan, you are a dangerous trap. He was talking to one of his very own disciples, the the one who would be the first among equals, the one who would be a standout leader when the early church did start early in the in the book of Acts, he was saying, uh, don't say that, get behind me, fall in behind me, get away from me, because you are a temptation to me. It's an insight into the humanity of Jesus, because Jesus knew that there was always door number two. 
It was always available to him. Not, not just in the wilderness when he was getting tempted by the devil. Right there in that moment, Je- the, the devil shows up again, coming through one of Jesus' disciples, offering Jesus a way out. A different option. An easier option. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. But understand, had Jesus taken door number two, it was game over for all of us. Had he entertained that thought, you know, you know what? Yeah, I could do that. I wouldn't have to go through all this torture and cross business. Let's leave that for somebody else. But in that moment, even though Peter was one of Jesus' followers, he's saying, I want to do things my way. And see, here's the difference between winners and losers. Winners listen to the coach. Even if the coach has led a life of sacrifice and pain because you realize that it's probably that sacrifice and that pain that has led to this coach being a winner. See, the first players did not always listen to Jesus' plan. It wasn't until the resurrection of Jesus where his players finally came around and said, oh, wait, okay, now we understand. Now we get it. Now we understand what you've been saying all of this time. And see, winners who are playing for a winning team, want to be a part of a winning tradition, must understand that the easiest way out is not the path to victory. And don't get caught up in what's more convenient, comfortable, or popular. Our commitment cannot be casual. And so Jesus gives his team this non-negotiable, same passage, verses 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, in other words, you're going to follow me, you're going to do And you're going to go through everything I've just experienced. You're going to follow me and do what I am going to do. You must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. A true follower will deny himself or herself and follow Jesus. Peter said all the right things. But at that moment, there were some questions as to whether or not he was actually ready to do... And and I feel that Peter's issue is our issue. There's been a lot of times in my life where I have been more than ready to say all the right things. And to say it the right way because that's my training and I can do that. But then when it came right down to it, I wasn't quite ready to put God's agenda and the mission of Christ ahead of my own personal goals. And it's very difficult and challenging. But see, denying yourself is rejecting selfish impulses. Self-reliance, selfish ambition, self-actualization, finding yourself, becoming yourself, whatever that it is that you want to call it, all those psychological terms that we hear all the time. And Jesus is saying, no, it's really about losing yourself if you want to find the life that I have for you. And see, there's only one way to do that. And it comes down to the very thing that I mentioned at, at the very beginning. It comes back to what we believe about the identity of Jesus. Because understand this, we won't follow Jesus as our leader until we trust him as our Lord. That's as basic as I can make it. People, this is a football. We've got to trust in the identity of Jesus and everything he said and everything he promised if we are going to be a part of a winning tradition. And it's more than just saying it with words. It's more than just gathering here in a room on a Sunday morning. It's living it out sacrificially every single day of the week. We've all seen the stories in professional sports where you've got the star athlete who could do everything right on the field, but the other seven days of the week they're off doing their own thing. And what happens? They become a distraction to the team. Even when they're not playing on the field or they're not at practice and they go off and they're living their life a different way and they're getting all this negative press and attention to the team, and they do that for, for so long. After a while, the coach is like, I've had enough with you because you're bringing the rest of the team down. And that can happen on God's team too. It's why it's so important that we go out and we understand that it's not just about a Sunday. It's how we are choosing to live our life in a sacrificial way every single day and denying ourselves for the cause of Christ. We're following Christ 24-7 in this sacrificial commitment with our whole life. And so let me ask you, and these are tough questions. Is your faith more about words or more about actions? They really should line up. They really should be congruent with one another. Are we following Jesus on our terms 
or his terms. And there is a huge difference. I've had several people that try to, that I have heard in conversations that try to negotiate with Jesus. So I'll follow you as long as you don't touch this area of my life. Or I'll follow you, but it's going to be on my terms and my timeline. And you fail to surrender, and which means you're failing to deny yourself. You're failing to give up your life for his sake. You're holding on to it too tight. So let me ask this question. Can you name a significant life change as a result of following Christ? That, really, that's a tough question. Can you name a significant life change? Like, I was one way and now I'm different, and all I could point to is Jesus. Can you name a significant pathway in life that you have chosen that you would have not normally chosen? It's not wouldn't have been the thing for you. And the only person that made that difference in your life was Jesus. Because we have to have one or more of four pathways in our life. We have to have a path of sacrifice, a path of service, a path of sharing, and a path of suffering. And at some point in time, we have to walk down every one of those paths. Or people will fail to see where Jesus has made a difference in our life. See, why is it? And this is going to sting a little bit. Why is it that the only time that we embrace these paths is when it actually comes to athletics? Why do we have no problem getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go for two-a-day practices? Or to go to swim practice? Or whatever your particular sport. Why is it the world only understands the path, the path of saf- sacrifice and suffering when it comes to sports and athletics? Because as much as I love a good game... It ain't going to get you to heaven. I'm sorry. It's just not. And I think we get back to the basics. We get back to this. And the world is going to see the church as unstoppable. Because we're going to have a clear mission. Part of a winning tradition is actually knowing what the win is. Vince Lombardi also said this. If it doesn't matter who wins or loses, then why do they keep score? At the end of the day, here's our mission. It's found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples... I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given to you, and sure, be sure of this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our mission here at this church is very clear. And we talk about this at Next Step Lunch. We try to bring it up in here as much as we can. We want to connect people to Christ, his community, and his cause. And you get to the cause part. You can read this. It's out in our hallway. We want to make disciples who will make a difference in the world. We are not interested in making church attenders. If you're here 52 weeks a year, but you're doing nothing for the cause of Christ, you're not impressing me and you're not impressing anybody else. We will only start making a difference in the world when we start making disciples disciples and serving serving is a big part of what it means to follow Jesus followers of Jesus serve like Jesus because Jesus clearly said I came to not to be served but to serve and so how do we follow Jesus we serve that's how we get the win and the win is a win for you you know why because people who serve complain less they're less cynical they're just more fun to be around. People who serve a lot more, see, you see yourself not as a spectator, but as a part of the game, and it, tra- it begins to transform your heart. As soon as you start serving, you start changing. But if you flip that around, if you're not serving, you're not growing. You're just, you're just on the bench. You're just pretending. It, it's time to get in the game. It's a win for the team. It's a win for the church. And I just saw these stats. High volunteer engagement equals faster growth. The church that has a higher uh, level of volunteer engagement reaches new people four times as fast. And the reason is, the people who you're serving, you're more inclined to invite people because you believe what's going on here. You're invested. And so you're going to invite people to something that you believe is going to be helpful for them. It's a win for the church, too, because people who are invested in serving in the church are a lot more generous. We have people that come here, and they're just kind of attending. They attend every once in a while. They give a little bit. We have people that have been here for a long time, and they they, they kind of consider themselves members by virtue of the fact they've been here for a long time. 
and they give a little bit more. And then we've got, we've, we, we have people who are, they are invested. They are locked in here. They are sacrificially serving, and they give at the deepest levels. And then the other benefit, big benefit for the church is the obvious one, and that's unity. Because you're on the same team. We have the same purpose. We're fighting for the same mission. And we all see ourselves as a part of something bigger than ourselves. And then finally, it's a win for the world. A serving church is a high-impact church. And a serving church is the kind of church that creates the kind of people who will go out into the world and will bring hope because we allow the world then to experience the love of God firsthand. Now, you may ask, how on earth is changing a diaper in the nursery or opening the door for somebody changing the world? How is that helping? It's because when you do that, in whatever role that you're playing here, you are allowing someone to experience the the person of Jesus firsthand coming through you. And that matters. And it doesn't just change you here. It changes you when you're in the community. It changes you when you're at the school board meeting. It changes you in the classroom. It changes you on the sports field. It changes you in your neighborhood, within your family. And so when you go to a church that makes disciples, you are a part of a winning tradition. Because at the end of the day, when Jesus is looking at us and and he's wanting to know, like, what did you do with what I gave you? He's not going to look at your bank account. He's not even going to look at the number of, of Sundays that you were at the church compared to the number of Sundays that you weren't at the church, although being here is important. He's not going to look at whether or not you said all the right things. He's going to ask one question. He said, did you make disciples? Did you make disciples? Did you help create people who would follow me in this world? Because going against popular belief that we all hear at a funeral, that when somebody passes away, they're in a better place, the reality of the situation, and I can only say that here, the reality of the situation is, The only people who are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, are those who did it really well and they made disciples. That is the only metric that matters. So let me ask you, are you willing to play your part? Are you willing to be a part of a winning tradition and be a part of this team? If you've been here for a while at this church and you have served and you have helped make us who we are today, thank you for being a part of the team. And I I value you so much. I'm so thankful for you. If you're newer here and you haven't had a way to plug in yet, you can come to Next Step Lunch and you're open to exploring opportunities, then that's great. We've got room on the team for you. And if you've been here for a while and you come every Sunday and you're just kind of riding the bench, it's time to get in the game. You've waited long enough. Come to Next Step Lunch. Come talk to me. We'll find you a place where you can plug in and you you can begin helping us continue this winning tradition. We're going to move into a time of communion. And it's really important for this Sunday because one of the most important things that we can understand is the heart of our coach. And the heart of our coach is this, that he came to give his life for every single one of us. This coach would not ask us to go and do something that he hasn't already done. And he went to the cross for you and for me to die for us, to give us life. And all he asks us to do is, would you go and when you make that same sacrifice, would you love someone else the way that I've loved you? And so we understand the heart of our coach in this moment that we can share and come around his table and remember what he's done for us by dying for us, giving his body on a cross, shedding his blood that we might receive the forgiveness of sins. That's who Jesus is. That's what he's done for us. And this is what we remember over the next few minutes. So I'm going to pray for us. And when it's right for you, go ahead and take the bread, which represents his broken body. And then we'll share the cup together. Father, we thank you so much for the, uh, the awesome privilege of being a part of your team. And then understanding that you will equip us to do what you've called us to do. That you will help us, Heavenly Father, to let other people experience who you are as the son of God, the hope of the world. And so we pray that you would help us to live like winners, but by being willing to lose, to lose to ourself, to lose what's important 
to us in order to elevate what matters most, what matters to you. To deny ourselves whenever possible. And we get that motivation from a moment just like this. We remember what you've done for us where you literally denied your own life. You denied yourself of all of the divine privileges so that you could come here as a human and die for each and every one of us. Father, may this moment be the motivation that we need to go out and to love the world. In Jesus' name, amen. remember his body and his blood, what he's done for every one of us to go out and let's live the same way. Thank you, God. A huge, huge way that you can be a part of the team here is with your finances. And we talk about it because Jesus did, because Jesus said we're your heart will be there, your treasure will be also. That's heart, treasure, they go together. And we show Jesus our heart through our sacrificial giving. And I want to thank you for being so generous. Uh, you have carried this church the last couple of years, very difficult times, where we can continue to be generous with our community and our missions partners. I'm so thankful for that. And so if you are prepared today, uh, we have offering plates on the back table. And you could also text your gift into 84321. And if it's your first time, it'll ask you which church. There's a few churches use the system. You can select Monticello Christian Church. But uh, I'll pray for the offering. Father, we're grateful to have the opportunity to give back, to trust you, and to be generous. And understanding that our generosity is an indication of our commitment and our belief that your team is the team that's going to win. We want to be a part of it. We glorify through the offering today in Jesus' name.
those words that encourage us, um, that you would fill us with wonder and that you would allow us to bring your love to those around us. Father, help us to to take the extra step that might be uncomfortable to, to love and care for your kingdom, for your people, God. Father, we pray that we would take those steps this week and the weeks to come, and that you would allow us to see your will, not ours, but yours. We thank you, we praise you, and it's in your awesome and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.